The following is a presentation of Morning Drive Media. Broadcasting from the delightful studio city, California. It's the Knapsack Files, and I'm Ken Knapsack with another edition of the Knapsack Files. But this one, my friends, is going to be, as they used to do in the 1980s, a very special Knapsack Files. And I'm saying it with a bit of humor, but this is going to be a serious topic, a serious discussion, though I'm sure there will be a little bit of humor, because if you can't laugh and joke, what's the point of living? Uh, I'm going to do a show today about depression. Hmm, that's uplifting. Hmm, but I think it's important. Uh, I've been open in the past about uh, my own depression, battles with uh, suicidal feelings and uh, suicidal tendencies and uh, dark, deep depressions and uh, going into the emotional cave. And uh, in the past, I've mentioned I've worked uh, through this uh, through about four years of solid therapy. And uh, and because I've been able to uh, open up about this, um, or be- not because I was able, because I did, I uh, have uh, received a lot of word, actually, from you guys out there in the Napsock Files list listening audience and the Schmoes No listening audience, effectively known as Schmoville. A lot of you have written to me and, and um, been open with what your struggles have been. And I have a lot of friends in the comedy industry, and that industry itself kind of lends itself to depression. And then uh, lately, uh, recently, we had the uh, the tragic passing of Robin Williams by suicide, and that opened up kind of a national discussion on depression, and a lot of, it, it really, really was out there about what is depression, and, and what's just being sad, and what's a, a actual inherent chemical problem, or what's a disease, and all that good stuff. And I think it's all good to get it out there, so I wanted to do that kind of show today. Day. Like I said, a very special Knapsack Files edition. So to help me uh, on that, I'm very grateful to have this man in my studio here because uh, I'm very grateful to have him in my life as he has been for, well, well over 10 years, I believe. Uh, he is Dr. Gary Ventimiglia. He is a 30-year professional in the uh, psychoanalysis business, and uh, he's written books. He's uh, been on radio shows. He's, this is old hat to him. He's looking at my studio going, yeah, whatever. But uh, he has... Uh, Grace to uh, grace my studios here today. I'm so so thankful that uh, Dr. Ventimiglia could come on in. So Gary, welcome to the Knapsack Files. Thank you very much, Ken. It is my pleasure to be here. Yeah. Now you uh, let's uh, up top just be open and honest about it, so there's no conflict of interest. I, I, I'm so concerned about the legalities of your career and what what can be said and told. But uh, you uh, worked with me for about four solid years. Yes. With a couple follow-ups. Yes. Yes. Uh, your sons. Uh, are uh, very close to me. Your oldest son uh, is, uh, well, I call him my brother. I don't even call him friend. I have best friends. I have a writing partner who's my best friend, Matt Key. I have Megan Finley, who's my best friend. But Paul is my brother. I almost consider you an extension uh, of my own family and you, me, I'm sure. Um, thank you, Ken. But year, no thank you. And years ago, um, I've been ba- I had battled depression since... Well, I remember it hitting about sixth grade, and I want to do want to talk to you about that later. But when it suddenly switches from happy-go-lucky kid to ugh, and I battled, 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 and it got dark. There was a couple of suicide attempts and suicidal uh, episodes, as I actually like to refer to them more than attempts. And um, one day, you looked at me across the couch and you said, "My office tomorrow, 10 a.m." And you gave me no choice. And I started my road to, well, I don't like to say recovery because I don't believe depression is a war that ever really ends. I think it's a daily, daily thing, and that's one of the things I want to get out there. But anyways, that's our relationship, so um, that's us up top. There are so many aspects of this topic that Mm. uh, we can explore, and the way that the public conscience has Mm. been elevated by the tragic death of Robin Williams is actually... uh, in, in, in a very sad kind of way, a, a blessing for the countries that mm-hmm. we would take a closer look again about what makes a person move from just having the blues or being down mm-hmm. to the level of depression, or we call it dysphoria, symptoms mm-hmm. that are so painful that one can even think of taking their own life. Yeah, and that's kind of where I want to start, is, is that point where it becomes uh, something bigger. And something deeper. Um, I think that's where you start to, um, where it starts to, like I said, it turned for me in the sixth grade. Fourth, fifth, third, fourth, fifth grade, I'd get down, 
but you know, if I had my GI Joe figures and and Transformers came on the TV or Robotech comic books came in the mail, I was good. And then about sixth grade, things maybe around the time of you know puberty beginning. Uh, you start to associate things like, oh, I like that girl. She doesn't like me back. That person doesn't like me. What am I going to do with my life? All that kind of stuff starts coming into your brain. And I think that's where it hit. Well, the the, the puberty aspect, the aspect mm. of all those changes taking place, both physically, uh, psychologically, I mean, cognitively, and especially emotionally, it opens you up to life and to what's inside of you. Mm. <laughs> Which is a... Kind of a dangerous, I mean, that's such an accurate way to look at it, of course, but that's kind of scary. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah, it, it, the rubber meets the road. It starts to meet the road then. That's so true. That's right kind of at that point. And um, so in your best in, in, in your best way, can you sum up depression in five minutes or less? No. Can you sum up, like, uh, like you said, let's start there. When is it just your blues, you're down, you're having a bad day, and where is it something that is deeper and darker and long term? Unfortunately, life is difficult, as uh, mm. uh, um, the, 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 the very famous author uh, Scott Peck said in The Road Less Traveled in the beginning of that uh, fabulous book, life is difficult, and it's the difficulties of life that get us down. Um, mm. uh, depression in a normal way simply means um, you know, being saddened uh, over the loss of something, you know, things don't go your way. Uh, uh, I mean, you could move from your home. You could mm-hmm. lose a girlfriend in the fourth grade. You know, you could mm-hmm. not be chosen for the kickball team until the very end. Um, you know, when you're a kid, things that are, that are depressive are just kind of normal feelings mm-hmm. that are uh, that are painful, but you get over them. You know, yeah. they, they don't they don't stick around and. And if you're not prone to, to depressive affect, which we'll t- explain in a mm-hmm. minute, th- that's basically what happens. You don't get stuck, stuck with this. Mm-hmm. As you get older uh, and hit, you know, like you hit puberty and relationships start to get more important, mm-hmm. you can have the same kind of understanding about the ups and downs of life. You have internal resources that you're able to, to view things in, in ways that that you can take the loss, you know, and you have other mm. things in your life that, that help you along. You have parents that are supportive and siblings and friends that are supportive. Right. Normal, uh, the normal uh, difficulties of life are, are processed and worked through in kind of just normal, ordinary ways with love and care and action, you know, it's when there are internal aspects of yourself uh, that you don't really uh, have a, a really good handle on mm-hmm. as you hit adolescence and in young adulthood that when these losses take place, um, they can become depressive. Mm. Yeah, and that's uh, – yeah, like you said, I, I could uh, – I, I, I struggled in ninth grade. I got, my, my goal was to be a professional baseball player. I got cut from the baseball team. This was the last time I was on the baseball field. And so it wasn't just about not getting on the team. Uh, it was uh, – I felt as though my dream was crushed. Now, the normal – this is where I, a big jumping off point in my life. The normal reaction in ninth grade at 14 years of age is he didn't make the baseball team. Some people might say, well, then good. That means you get out to that practice field, you work harder, and you set that goal, and you come back next year, and you make the team. I simply hung my head and said, well, I guess that ended and let it burrow deep into my soul. Uh, now, would I have gone on to be a Major League Baseball player? Probably not. I could never hit a curveball, and I'm scared of things thrown too fast. But um, that set the tone, I think, for my life, where for many, many years it was, uh, all right, well, that didn't work out. Um, time to go. And quite literally, at one point, I couldn't work it through. Uh, so when I got asked to leave the ground lanes after four years of studying comedy improv there, that was one of the, the first points where I tried to you know, jump off a five-story building um, because I couldn't work through and I didn't see what else I had or I couldn't just get that uh, the resources and be like, all right, well, we're going to try something else or re- we're not done yet. Rah, rah, rah. Yeah. Um, the... the, the- the interesting comparison that you mm-hmm. you've made between the loss of the Grambling and um, um, the, <laughs> the Groundlings, the but ground- I didn't play for Grambling. <laughs> it's okay; it doesn't matter now. Yes, well, <laughs> the the loss of that wonderful organization of actors, yeah. um, and the loss of the baseball opportunity when you were yeah. fourteen years old. 
interesting part is one is an adult experience, you know, yeah. uh, of of loss. Yeah, mid twenties. Yeah, and the other is uh, an, an adol- early adolescent experience of loss. Um, but you share, and it, its impact on you was very much the same. That it, mm. it's the meanings of the loss, and the meanings of the loss when you were fourteen. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, it's painful and. Uh, it has had a lot to do with your view of yourself, mm-hmm. um, the, the self-denigration that you felt. Um, but still, even at 14, though, there's, there's opportunities and there's chances to do other things. And, and you're still very much under the uh, protective care of parents. Mm-hmm. Um, but the feeling state of helplessness and, and perhaps hopelessness at that point at 14 seems like was the same when you were 25 in your mid-20s. And yeah. this opportunity for your life's work and the loss of that, the same kind of response, the self-denigration response, the helplessness of doing something for it, and maybe the, the newer aspect is feelings of hopelessness that, you mm-hmm. know, you, you can't make it. Downward spiral, feelings develop, mm-hmm. depression is there. How do you, how do you start to know the difference to to work on it? I, that was the thing I struggled with early on because sometimes it was just it was just my natural habitat to live in was this state of eh, it was me. Um, when do you start to know? It's it's uh, you know it's levels of pain. Mm. Um, it is one thing to be in the the doldrums, you know, to to be down and you know. Uh, you know, you need to maybe have a have a cigarette, <laughs> or uh, you know, go watch "I Love Lucy" on the television, or to do something that brings you up uh, right. because it's something you enjoy. Right. Um, when the normal aspects of your life don't bring you that kind of joy, mm-hmm. when the loss is permeating yourself in different uh, in in different circumstances. The feelings, uh, the, the the deadly down feelings of, you know, of hurt and even even despondency. When they don't go away, when yeah. they are there, when they start to become physical, when you start to mm. lose sleep, when you see your diet changing, you you aren't you know you're not hungry or you're eating way too much. Right. When you start to suffer. Mm. Uh, in in clear ways that people around you even see that there's something wrong. Mm-hmm. There is something wrong. Yeah, yeah. And and then uh, yeah, you mentioned there when the th- when the things can't get you back up. I'm a little older now, but it doesn't make it any easier. But two years ago, I made that decision to uh, um, you know go go go. Um, I came out of uh, my work with you in a much better spot where I can process it. But every once in a while, I still have to go check in. Yeah. Every once in a while, I'll give you a ring. Hey, let me just stop back in. Or I run into you at a, at a family event. And, uh, sure. And I need that. I also have much more support. Uh, and there's a difference between open on, op, being open about it and too confessional about it. Um, some I, There's a difference in my mind where before it was just like uh, – um, all, if I talked about it, it was because I've, I couldn't process it. I was just trying to get it out. But now it's more like, hey, here's the thing I have. I've dealt with it. I've worked on and, and I continue to fight it. But yeah, I have that thing sometimes where I tell some friends who get really down and out, like, all right, you know what you need to do? You need to put in your favorite music. Go get your favorite cheeseburger. Go give up for a day. And tomorrow it's all over. It starts all over again. Uh, it, it is my version of the Wilson Phillips "Hold On" one song. Go get a cheeseburger um, or something you like, and then. But yeah, what you're saying is the next day, and the next day after, the next day after, then you know you got something you got to deal with. Well, um, there is just a qualitative difference between um, feeling down or blue or at a loss, feeling mm-hmm. depressed over something that happens to you. Um, uh, that can be painful. There can there can be anguish in that, you know. Mm. Um, but it is not what we're talking about when we talk about someone who is clinically depressed. Right. There's a scripture in the Old Testament book of Proverbs that mm. says, "Good news puts fat on the bones." Fat on the bones was a mm. way of talking about um, 
well-being. You know, food mm-hmm. was a, was an important aspect uh, back then, um, as it is now. But <laughs> but um, uh, it meant that that you know, good news made you feel better. And the kind of depressiveness that you're talking about, mm-hmm. the cheeseburger and and uh, and uh, the music was it Wilson Pickett or Wilson was it? Wilson Pickett, or Wilson was Phillips or, or Wilson or Pickett, Wilson whatever Phillips. gets you up. Yeah, well, well, well <laughs> Wilson Pickett, uh, he's all right. Um, that that all of that, uh, um, if it makes you feel better, it puts fat on the bones. Mm. Um, it you know you're gaining perspective from it. You're seeing yeah. life has got more to it than just the the loss of the thing or the difficulty of the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but but those are that is, those are the loud Russian neighbors I have. They're they're a staple of the knapsack files. You just have to ignore them. They might be depressed because that's what they're working through. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they might just have some anger. It reminded me of an old termite commercial that I uh, seen <laughs> back in the '60s. Um, uh, but I will not become depressed over it. You know, work so, through it. Yeah, I'm working through Let's it. Let's right have now. a cheeseburger with Wilson Pickett. <laughs> Wilson Pickett. Oh uh, yes. So is, is there and there's a certain shame still with kind of saying you're depressed. I think people struggle with that. It, they don't want to admit it or something. It's 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 a sad a uh, sad fact, Ken. That that is still around uh, even with uh, the tremendous, you know. Uh, um, mm-hmm. uh, what's the word? The tremendous amount of publicity that depression ha- gets, and and even you know from some famous people dying, uh, that yeah. it gets more. Well, I'll, ju- I'll jump in on the Rob- the Robin Williams thing. Now, let me just say this: uh, professionally, I was not a huge fan of him. I know a lot of people were greatly influenced. I'm a, I'm a Steve Barton guy. Yeah. But to get that out, but but a tragic situation, and this is a man, this is a husband, this is a father. So it, it's. Um, that was the number one part that that affected me is it's like ah oh, that's so sad for me two things uh came out of it one it it scared me because at 63 he lost this battle with depression and the impulse control and yeah there now we're hearing uh maybe there's some parkinson's disease and everything i'm sure just added to it I, I that wasn't the reason why but he lost this fight he had lost this fight with sobriety after 20 years and now after 63 years he lost this fight and it scared me because i know i haven't won the fight i'm still fighting it to the end of my days i just about two months ago went through a very dark weekend mm. um so it scared me there and two it shocked me with the people and i i i, I can be nice and say I understand where they're coming from a little bit with these angry posts. But the people who post things about uh, what a coward's way to go out and everything, let me just tell you something, folks. When you're when you're in that deep dark spot, I was there two and a half months ago or so. I I the thought of suicide um, is a relief. And that's not right. It's it's the perversion of the situation, but it is an absolute relief in your head. It is the I'm going to go now. Uh, there's a song by Josh Joplin group called I've Changed. And, and, and the lyric in, in the chorus where I, I've changed, I've put the barrel in my mouth and everything I've thought before, I won't think again because I've changed. That's... So I was shocked to see people still in 2014 and all this stuff we're trying to work through to post those type of things on social media about what a coward the way to die that's the way to, you know depression's a deep dark thing man it's uh one of the one of the clear aspects of all of this and and writers about depression uh, mm-hmm. sp- certainly clinicians who, who work with a lot of depressed people will tell you is someone who can can mock mm-hmm. uh the experience of a clinically depressed person has not had that experience themselves yeah and and it's obviously it's tragic that people would be so mean spirited anyway, yeah. um, but the clear sense of um, despair that ending one's life is better than the constant pain of of that depression, mm-hmm. the full bodily pain of depression, uh, needs to uh, obviously bring up compassion in us. Yeah, and and with that compassion comes a little st- bit of strength is sometimes needed. A little bit of kind of a uh, share Nick Cage slap on the face, snap out of it. Sometimes needs to happen. Um, the the toughest person I've had to explain my depression to is is your son, who who. Well, you're depressed? Stop being depressed. This is answer to everything because he just has that kind of personality. And we've joked about it for 15 years now. It's even in a movie that's coming out is me talking about him finding me uh, curled up under a 
couch crying at two in the morning at work and him just going, hey, why don't you stop that? <laughs> and he actually meant it very well. Um, it's it's to get to that point. Sometimes you need that. Hey, man, but you have to – the compassion has to – if you're dealing with someone who's depressed, you have to have that overriding sense of compassion for the situation. Well, you know, uh, some people don't want to allow uh, – that level of, of uh, emotional pain in their lives because it makes them feel that they're weak. And so there's all kinds of ways of masking that, uh, either by um, the biggest, yeah. obviously, is uh, substances. Mm -hmm. uh, but another one is a kind of false, uh, what is it, vibrato? Uh, the, a false bravado, vibrato, yeah, absolutely. You know? and, and that you don't want to look at uh, things about yourself. Now, I can't say this about my son, since I know him so well, <laughs> and I have seen him depressed before. Yes. I think, yes. I, think, I think Kenny loves you, and he doesn't want you to suffer. Well, that's what it was. But, but I have um, – I, I mentioned that not to uh, – uh, it wasn't a, a negative. At the time, he, he's maybe struggled, but I actually needed that type of person in my life because sometimes it is oh, just yeah. that simple. Yeah. Stop doing that. Yeah. Again, though – uh, and we, we we keep going back to this mm -hmm. this kind of uh, differentiation, and that yeah, is yeah. between you know even what would be seen as a you know as a a, a pretty moderate and the sense even painful every man's depression where something's happened and there's a loss and you're working through it and you can feel down and you can even mm -hmm. feel some anguish to when it becomes clinical, yeah, to when it becomes what we call a major depressive disorder, which is you know, the official uh, diagnostic and statistical manual of mental mm. uh, mental health, uh, mental disorders, where major depressive disorder has this conocopia of symptoms mm. which touches every part of your life. And, yeah. and those symptoms um, are, are emotional, mm. they're physical, you know, bodily you know, yeah. as well as in, in, in an attitudinal kind of way. And just to change one's behavior at that point doesn't, doesn't do the trick. Mm -hmm. So again, it is the understanding and being able to recognize because of symptoms mm -hmm. just how powerful that depression has become. Yeah. What, what, let's, let's, let's get on the road to recovery then. So you get to that point, where do you go? Because I was lost in the wilderness by myself. Um and things I had in my life, a good family, um, good friends, a faith-based uh, way of looking at life, all those things um, and, and more, uh, and goals and all that. I wasn't a drifter looking around for you know a next bottle of alcohol with nothing to do. I had goals. I was a young, good, good boy, grew up a good boy, had all the tools at my disposal, and it still hit me. Um, it had hit my father before me, so I see some um, some chemicals in play there, some some genetics coming down the pipeline there. Very much so. But uh, I ha I still wasn't on the road to recovery until you sat me down, and it wasn't just you, but it was you going, all right, come through this door because this road leads you out of this forest. You, I mean, not not wishing to to talk about your particular case, but people have. Uh, ways of defining themselves, mm -hmm. obviously from growing up from their fundamental attachments with parents mm -hmm. um, and, and caretakers. Um, and simplistically stated, we develop a sense of ourselves, and we can call it a self-concept or, or aspects of self-esteem, mm -hmm. which give us then levels of self-confidence, Okay, mm. and in that um, we see ourselves as competent or incompetent uh, on, mm. on the continuum of that yeah. in living and dealing with life. Mm. Um, in working with depression, yeah. one of the things that you have to look at is to see where is this person at. What is the level of suffering that they have in relation to this sense of self? Mm. How do they feel about themselves? In, in the doing of their normal activities, do they feel overwhelmed? Mm. Do they feel uh, unable, in, incapable of, of doing the tasks or relating to people, relating to people in ways that they can get more of what they want out of life? Mm. Or are they so taken up with the, the, the depressiveness, the symptomatology of the depression, you know, the, mm. the negativity, the, the fear, you know, the, the, um, the withdrawing, that they have to, which they have to fight in their normal lives, 
that mm. they really can't live their lives in a way that is productive uh, for themselves. Mm. In that sense, if I'm working with someone who is on that level, uh, we call it dysphoria, again with low mood, mm. again with a sense of despondency about the future, feeling helpless and changing themselves, I have to start to think about is this depression, uh, has it become a depressive illness? Mm -hmm. And there's lots of literature about the neurophysiology of depression, which would take another whole show. <laughs> you, and, you've brought a whole bunch of books here to, to back that claim there. Well, it, it would be be and it'd be better for a, a, a psychiatrist, a medical <laughs> doctor, not yeah. just a, a lowly PhD, um, to be able to talk about the neurophysiology. But things happen in your brain mm -hmm. that makes it harder for you to... Uh, to make life work. And mm. then there's things that they have seen in certain kinds of, of uh, little, little critters called neurotransmitters that are in your brain and, and how they get stuck and yeah. how they need to be opened up and certain medications really help that. So the first aspect is in, is in assessment okay. is to see just where's this, where this depression at in this person? Where is their life at? Where is the level of despondency and the level of hope? Where does suicidality yeah. come in? You know, yeah. depression is an everyday experience of painfulness. Mm. And in a, in, a, in a moment, I'll read a, I'll read a couple of quotes. I, I yeah. brought them just because uh, they 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 really get 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 some of the meat on on the bones here. Um, but dealing with the reasons why people get depressed from their environment. Mm. You know, how they were raised, how they feel about themselves, their fears in taking action in, 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 in doing things, taking chances, especially in relationships, um, how, how fearful or confident you feel about, you know, going after someone and caring about them and loving them, or, or, or you can't because you're too afraid, that just mm. keeps the depression going. So yeah. the first statement mm -hmm. is... Um, one has to understand what is the level of depression, what is it doing in the person, mm -hmm. and and for a person you know who's kind of uh, assessing themselves, how much of life are you missing out on because you feel depressed? Mm. Yeah, guy, that's a good way to put it. I was at that. I had missed a ton. <laughs> yeah. I had missed a ton. What 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 are the uh, the things you want to read here? How do they apply? Well, I, I you know what, one of the things I wanted to read was uh, just the sense of what it means to be depressed. This yeah, is, this please, is yeah. from a book uh, by William uh, um, Styron, Darkness uh, Visible, A Memoir of, of Madness. And this, this chap actually wrote, um, he wrote a couple of books you would, you would uh, probably recognize. Sophie's Choice, he wrote. He wrote, mm. um, he wrote The Confessions of Nat Turner. Uh, sophisticated writer. And he was, he was writing about depression. Mm -hmm. uh, and he says, what I had begun to discover is that mysteriously and in ways that are totally remote from normal experience, the gray drizzle of horror induced by depression takes on the quality of physical pain, hmm. but it is not an immediately identifiable pain like a broken limb. It may be more ac accurate to say that despair owing to some evil trick played upon the sick brain by the inhabiting psyche comes to resemble the diabolical discomfort of being imprisoned in a fiery, overheated room. And because no breeze stirs this cauldron, because there's no escape from this smothering confinement, it is entirely natural that the victim begins to think ceaselessly of oblivion. Mm -hmm. I uh... A lot of fancy words to tell you that you get overwhelmed and you think there's no way out. And you feel it. Yeah. I mean, it be, actually becomes a physical feeling. Mm -hmm. You can't concentrate. Yeah. Um, it feels very disruptive mm -hmm. to who you are and everything mm -hmm. that you do. Mm -hmm. And on a day-to-day -day level, someone's saying, oh, don't worry, uh, you look good. Or don't worry, you're funny. Don't worry, don't worry. A lot of people still have struggle. But I don't understand Rob Williams. He, he was so funny. And so, oh, none of that matters when you're in that quote. When you're lost in that quote, none of that stuff matters because you can't see that stuff. It's all real stuff. Yeah, Robin had a great career and influenced generations of people, comics yes. and whatnot. Yes. It didn't matter. 
it didn't matter in the end, um, uh, unfortunately. Um, you know that that quote uh, by Henry David Thoreau: "Most men lead lives of um, un, unbearable uh, sorrow." Mm-hmm. Um, it's a it's a very powerful quote. I mean, I don't know if most men do, but there's a lot of folks mm-hmm. who, uh, you know, again the the proverbs say, "Even in laughter, the heart knows sorrow." Mm-hmm. That what's going on internally. Um, because it is not accepted in the populace, can be can be hidden, mm-hmm. but but it's there, mm-hmm. it's there. And to to get to what you were saying uh, about dealing with this, mm-hmm. um, you know, if 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 medication is not uh, either indicated or if it's something that a person doesn't want to do, you know, what do you do with this deep level of pain within you? Mm-hmm. And you have to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of the self-care that is important in this um, can be life-saving. Mm-hmm. One thing you never do is you never become an isolated person. Yeah. I think I remember something about you being an isolated person. Very isolated. And and, and my mother, who would try to help me through it, would say um, one way, you know, hey, get outside of yourself. Go volunteer. Go be a part of something. Uh, go to a, go to a you know, um, a, a vet, a clinic or something and, and help with the dogs. Get outside of yourself because you're just wrapped up in yourself, And that, which is why I'm – yes, exactly. That's why I'm here. And uh, those type of people, uh, we seem to be of that ilk. Um, I say it now that de- depression is, by its very nature, selfish. Um, but a lot of people misinterpret that as me being an a-hole because I'm depressed. It's just the thoughts of y- you being so bad come first before the good thoughts. And I have tremendous good thoughts and did then. Um, but, yes, I was very isolated. Well, look at my life now. Um, I, I, you know, it's not – this isn't bragging, but, you know, I throw a birthday party. Fifty people from – Five different walks of life are going to be there because I've allowed them to be in my life. When in the, back then I, I would have, have had two at a party. I have been at uh, birthday parties and the hot dogs are always sizzling. I have to tell you <laughs> that right now. Mm-hmm. Tremendous, tremendous change. Yeah. the The idea of of um, not isolating. The flip side of that. Mm-hmm is making sure that you're with people that you could be honest with, that you have a support system, Uh, not just isolating. That's a great point, yeah. And that these people know that you're going through a difficult time. Mm -hmm. They can be affirming. They're not critical. Again, another flip side of that is you stay away from toxic people. Yeah. You stay away from them. So what you're saying is, yeah, okay, so you're isolated. That doesn't mean start heading out of the club um, or, you know, getting, you know, even going to volunteer. You're going to meet meet people on the surface. It's who you have around you that can actually – you're not afraid to expose yourself and, and with, with no fear of judgment or uh, repercussions, you know, and that's what I have with a lot of friends. I have some friends now who send me a text. I know when they're sending me a text, it's real and dark for them. And you just have to be there as quick as you can with a text or a call or an email and a follow up. And I and I try to do that as much as I can with these folks because um, we all move and shake and life goes by and you can go three, four weeks before you've checked on your friend. Um, but, yeah, so the, I, I really like that point. I really like that point. It's people who you can be honest with. Yeah. And and people who think about you mm-hmm. when they're not with you. Um, they they only aren't there when you're suffering, mm. um, but they are there because they love you. Yeah, going back to that good old book of Proverbs, it talks mm. about love covering a multitude of sins. Yeah. And the experience of being loved, uh, even on friendship level, not even talking about deep romantic love, but on mm-hmm. that friendship, that camaraderie level, really is an amazing, uh, it's an amazing thing. One of the books I brought... Um, an older book by mm-hmm. Douglas Bloch, B-L-O-C-H, called When Going Through Hell, Don't Stop. And it's a survivor's guide to overcoming anxiety and clinical depression. Oh, wow. He, he didn't uh, he, he didn't take uh, – the, the medication he took for, for his mm-hmm. depression didn't work. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. and he went through some heavy duty suffering. And there's a whole thing about medications and different well, ones it, it, and all of that. Whether it's here or later in the discussion, I do want to get into that because uh, you know um, I didn't take any, though you had suggested some, and I decided uh, to not go to it. But we did. I went for some medical tests, checked my thyroid, and checked a lot of other things. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Things came back clear, and because of that, I kind of felt I wanted to give it a go on my own. I, mm-hmm. Not that there was anything bad about the medication aspect. No. Um, And one of the things that's important about medication, um, just briefly right now, is uh, you really need to have an attitude towards it of wanting it to work, Mm -hmm. of not feeling depressed because you need to take some medication. People are on medication for everything. Right. It's funny, people can be on medication for the corns on their feet, (laughs) but not want to take an antidepressant because somehow or other it makes them weaker. Right. Um, but but in this book by uh, Blosh, he didn't take medication mm-hmm. for reasons, and we'll get into it in a moment. Um, but his major depression lifted because his friends did a series of series of what he calls interventions, not the, mm-hmm. in the in the classic sense, although close to it. Sure, interventions where they brought him to a house and people sat and told him what they thought of him. You know, mm. fifteen people showed up. And just told him what they thought of him and where he had helped them and what kind of a guy he was. And they did it. Uh, they did it uh, uh, every month, if I remember correctly. And I think it was either after the first or definitely the second. Mm-hmm. His depression lifted. His right. clinical depression lifted. Um, that's an amazing uh, mm-hmm. experience. But but in us. In, in, in us as, as physical beings, our bodies have a kind of self-writing tendency. Obviously, if you cut yourself, there's healing that takes place. Sure. Even in depressiveness and in, in depression, the body has ways uh, of, of rejuvenating itself. Sometimes it, takes, it will take a long time. Mm-hmm. It could even be years if you're not having the kind of support that you have. Right. Other times it could be faster. So I'm here just to say that what D- Douglas Bloch talks about is... That again, experience of love covering a multitude of depression, you mm-hmm. know, in this sense. Don't isolate. Make sure you have people around you who care for you. Um, reduce the stress in your life. Mm. Make sure that you put a structure on your life. You know, mm. one of the things that I know you're going to, it sounds funny, but when I was depressed, this is, a, this is 20 mm. years ago, um, one of the things that helped me maintain was having kind of a self-disciplined regime mm-hmm. of making sure I I brushed my teeth every morning when I got up you know I I had a nice breakfast I um you know I I dressed well like, right. that, that I thought I would you know and just having that sense of taking care of myself mm-hmm. um I made sure I watched uh, California Angels baseball on television during that season. With Bob Starr. With Bob Starr, yes, Mm -hmm. yes. That kind of thing about setting up structure in your life that you can rely upon with enjoyable aspects, Mm. it's taking care of yourself, treating yourself better. Kind of feeling like you're a functional member of society, even though the inside's kind of mush. Is that kind of it? Yeah, I mean, that that you can enjoy some things Mm -hmm. you know um and actually it's important to see where you can find that enjoyment and a lot of a lot of places you won't be able to find that enjoyment because of the down affect Mm -hmm. but that you go and you look and you and you you find things that you know it could be it could be uh watching old movies you know it it could Mm -hmm. be swimming and by the way when Mm -hmm. i think about that it's very important to to do cardiovascular exercise Mm -hmm. to run to swim, you know, to de- develop a sweat, to exercise, um, endorphins get going. Yeah. It's an interesting phenomena of running, let's say running, and feeling the runner's high even while you're depressed. It's mm-hmm. helpful. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, like what you said, the uh, daily regimen and, and um, when I really would go into it, the worst state of depression I had uh, early mm-hmm. 2003, mm-hmm. Uh, this is right at the end of uh, my time at the Groundlings and all that thing, been voted out and I didn't know how to process it and I went into my cave. I literally, I went to work, I did function in that regard, but came home and put on Madden on the PS2 and played video game football for about 35 to 40 straight days. I didn't function so at the end of it, what happened? I tried to kill myself. 
<laughs> video games are they are an enigma yeah to say the least yeah um so yeah so having that um that just daily get up I, I like the title of this book when going through hell don't stop i don't know i'd, I'd be curious to read this book but a survivor's guide to overcoming anxiety and clinical depression what a great time but just that when going through hell don't stop to me not reading that book to me means that kind of thing you're going to process it. Maybe take an hour, enjoy a cheeseburger that you like. Because, Absolutely. You know, uh, Absolutely. Listen to that Wilson Pickett album. Wilson uh, Pickett is, you know, <laughs> he's right up there with uh, Wilson Phillips, if I, you know, the, 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 the all girls band. Yes. Um, but to find the little things. But yeah, to and just keep going forward. The bigger things are still there. They're not gone. No. Um, I, I found that towards the end coming out of my work with you. Um, Focusing on the career stuff, uh, which I do now, maybe sometimes too much. Um, mm. But uh, <laughs> sorry, I haven't produced any kids for you yet. Um, I want them. Um, but uh, yeah, getting that uh, daily, daily dose down. So I, in other words, I almost don't have time to stop and be depressed. Um, well, that's and that's actually what uh, another book that I brought. Uh, mm. the, 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 the title of it says "Depressive Illness: The Curse of the Strong," <laughs> written by a psychiatrist. And there's another Tim book that says, uh, "Ken, just slow down for a second. Well, <laughs> that's what that's saying. That's the uh, the hieroglyphics. Uh, the, our our uh, Ken, slow down. Yeah. A lot of times, strong people who don't allow the normal experiences of loss of mm-hmm. of the exigencies of life, of the difficulties of life, mm-hmm. impact them. Um, they don't leave you. They they get recorded in your in your mind in your head, and they can yeah. come cascading down when you know when the dam breaks when something else happens. Well, that's a good point. I'll, I'll jump in there because so in two thousand three, this this incident happens, and and I get found at work, and and uh, um, I almost jumped off a building and all this kind of stuff, and then I recovered and I, I went back to church and I did this and that and I put on this smile and you know what it worked. Until almost a year later when I put a gun to my head. Yes. And I think a little bit of that, too. I didn't stop to really acknowledge. I didn't get the outside help. I tried to deal with it myself and do these checkmark things. Well, if you go to church, you're going to be fine. If you do this, you're going to be fine. You're going to, oh, now, boom, it exploded almost literally um, uh, with a, a loaded gun in my hand uh, every, to my temple. Everybody gets depressed in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, the percentages of, of people who in their depression would put a loaded gun to their temple are, it's higher than you think. I don't mm, want to give imagine. a percentage right now, but yeah. it's higher than you think. And, uh, again, it is, it is one of the most important aspects of, uh, mental health, um, mm. is to be able to see that what is going on in you has been suffered by others and mm. has been overcome by others. That's why it's so important that when you have anything that is a, on a continuous level, a, a depressive level in your life, um, that is important to seek help and to seek therapy, to, to, mm-hmm. to seek psychotherapy. I mean, it's okay to be in group therapy or even in support groups, uh, 12-step programs, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but but individual psychotherapy gets at what is going on in your life. Yeah. The vulnerabilities, the, the real deep sense of shame that so hamstrings us mm-hmm. from being able to, to be overcomers. And you were very, very smart to heed my uh, statement to you about... <laughs> Being in psychotherapy, being in hardcore therapy. Yeah. Well, it, it, what you did uh, again. Don't want to go uh, as much as detail as I can get. Sometimes one of the things I look back and what you did is it was like, all right, how did we get here? Let's identify what may have caused it. Putting no fault on anyone else, parents or otherwise, <laughs> or things. Um, no, you're good. Cough away. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, putting, you know, finding out, breaking it down. Literally, we broke it down, and then, and some people I, I, I know out there, uh, I'll, I'll talk, uh, uh, and some have even referred to you, uh, and it hasn't happened, but, but uh, a lot of times I hear, I've heard a remarkable amount of times. I just don't want to go to therapy because I just think I'm going to just cry the whole time, and I'm like, oh yeah, I did that too. 
Maybe four or five straight sessions, you cry. Some days you and I would sit there and talk, and I'd be like, you know, you want to get a turkey sandwich? Because yeah, that's <laughs> right. Things weren't that, that, that deep that week. Um, that's right. It's a long, long, but that's over a stretch of four, almost five years that I did the work. But that's what you did first. You broke it down so I could start to see. And that's what I w- want the people out there to, to start to listen to who might still be struggling and not understanding what you're struggling. You've got to understand your enemy. That's right. And, and that's what you did. You broke it down to, you know, again, no blame was ever put anywhere. If anything, I came out, you know, you can go to parents, but it was like I started for the first time ever. Oh, my parents are humans. Yes. And I would, I'd be terrified to raise a child, especially one that started to get dark and depressed. Yeah. And you, so you, you, there's no anger in it. It's, it's going up oh, that, 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 that led to this. And now I can start working on it. Understanding uh, creates hope. Mm-hmm. And hope uh, is the number one virtue that, uh, keeps us going yeah to, to hope for that which can be good in our lives to hope for the suffering to to be alleviated or greatly lessened and to understand that you know you have certain views of yourself you do certain things that have certain kinds of you know continuous results mm-hmm. that are harmful or hurtful or or um or, or um self-denigrating to have those experiences uh, to be able to understand what we call their ideology, where they where they come from, mm. gives you the opportunity to to intervene, to to make a different choice, to make a different decision. And uh, you, you use the word choice, um, though. There's a lot of um, genetics and, and 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 chemicals and, and and actual disease involved in this. I think there's still that you've got to make that choice consistently on a daily basis i got a list of songs i can pull you up on my ipod that if i wanted to within two minutes i'll be in a deep state of depression oh my god and i have to choose not to or some days i go into the tank because i want to and that's dangerous and that's why the williams thing scared me a little bit it was like ah this is still gonna go oh yeah um but it is a wake up every day beyond just the i don't want to go to work traffic oh i gotta go do that uh, podcast tonight. Oh, I got to do this. Um, it's uh, just, uh, you know, <laughs> picking up and go. Yeah, I, oh, you're picking up another book. I, I wish, folks, I wish you could see the books we've got here. And you've got a. Um, I've got to find this uh, this book because it, it I mean, uh, this quote, mm-hmm. uh, it is such a amazing quote um, that I will spend the rest of my time here. Yeah. Looking for for it. Um, <laughs> we, we will here it is. It, it, it's from the book called When Life Goes Dark, Finding Hope in the Midst of Depression by Richard Winter is mm. his name. The title of my sixth grade year in school. He is quoting a chap named Andrew Solomon who wrote this book, The Noonday Demon, An Atlas of Depression. And he's writing about taking a shower. Okay. He says... Little has been written about the fact that depression is ridiculous. I can remember lying frozen in bed, crying because I was too frightened to take a shower, and at the same time knowing that showers are not scary. I ran through the individual steps in my mind. You sit up, you turn and put your feet on the floor, you stand, you walk to the bathroom, open up the bathroom door, go to the edge of the tub. I divided it into 14 steps, as onerous as the Stations of the Cross. I knew that for years I had taken a shower every day, hoping that someone else would open the bathroom door. I would, I would, with all the force of my body, sit up, turn, and put my feet on the floor, and then feel so incapacitated and frightened that I would roll over and lie face down. Mm-hmm. I would cry again, weeping because the fact that I could not do it seemed idiotic to me. At other times, I have enjoyed skydiving, it is easier to climb along a strut towards the tip of a plane's wing against an 80 mile an hour wind at 5,000 feet than it was to get out of bed on those days. Mm. Mm. The thing that jumps out of me on that too is sometimes feeling that you know this is ridiculous, that you know you should be happy. And sometimes I'd be overwhelmed by that. Just so honest, Ken. So honest. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Depression is sad. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's sad to be depressed. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's okay. I mean, you're sad yeah. about something that's happened, but yeah. it's but a depressed person is is sad because you are missing out on life. Yeah, you're wounded. It's the walking wounded, and you need to be taken care of and to take care of yourself. You need to move out of that depressive state, mm. and the steps that need to be taken. The particular steps that need to be taken, you need to be doing that. The worst thing that the sadness of depression can do is to cause us to not get out of bed. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we need people to help us get out of bed. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we can just about do it ourselves. Um, but either way, you, you need to get out of bed. It ties to that routine, that regiment. If you can purely function today, you, you can start to fight this battle. Um, but again, I know reading that, that was a great excerpt because I know that feeling. I'd be sitting around knowing that I had a, a talent to make people laugh or knowing that I had goals, knowing that I had good people around me, knowing that I had a job, though I didn't like it and it was lower paying than I wanted. To. Knowing all these things, I'd sometimes look and I still don't, I'm still not happy. Well, I'm just an idiot hmm. and uh, ungrateful worthless idiot and it would bury me more i couldn't get up to take that veritable shower there as you're saying the figurative shower i could i knew i knew i'd done it before i knew i made a big choice to move to la at 22 um i had done a lot of brave things huge um you know well in in the midst of those feeling states um the the good can get pushed out you know, of your self-reflection. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's very important to have people around you who can remind you. Uh, again, with this this chap, Donald uh, Bloch, went uh, mm-hmm. in this this great idea of having interventions. Um, yeah. it, it broke something free within him, and he felt... Well, his, his, his neurophysiology obviously changed, but he mm-hmm. felt so much better. Yeah. What do you say to someone who's still working with it years, you know, I'm talking a lot about how you started to deal with me, but so, someone maybe 10, 20 years into the game is still dealing with it and has done therapy and has done medication and has eaten that cheeseburger and has gotten up and taken that shower, but other days rolled over and cried. 20 years in, that's where it might get hopeless. That's where I'm sure uh, Robin Williams felt hopeless. Uh, how, what do you say? Well, you know, it, it's very interesting. Um when you start to say that, and when you you were you know describing this person, then when you actually describe spoke of Robin Williams, mm. my mind goes to the particularities of that person. I want to know about that person's life in the last twenty years. Mm. What kind of things that that person is about? You know what what limitations do they have that that are um, real limitations, and what limitations are because of whatever the the the, the perceived understanding of oneself. And mm, yeah. to be able to to create some newness uh, by the intervention of the therapy in whatever particular ways are needed, um, mm. you know, we psychoanalysts we're not, we're not above uh, um, um, uh, offering uh, adaptive behaviors as intervention in a, in a person's life. Um, mm. The idea of it is is. Well, even in the sense of Robin Williams, uh, and so much is not known, mm-hmm. but yeah. uh, the idea of exactly what was going on in the sense of the, of the substance abuse, um, the, the um, fragile sense of his psyche from previous heavy-duty substance abuse, mm-hmm. what kind of treatment was he having, what, what was the level of intervention related to the, to the depression itself. Mm. And then, you know, this idea of was there a physical malady, you know, a, a, a long-term degenerative physical malady, was that a part of the equation, mm-hmm. you know? And so I just to say this that in your, in your hypothetical person, mm. um, I don't see a person not having hope. Um, I go yeah. after all the particulars and, and, and try to see what's there and to offer interventions on, on different levels of contact. Is it to maybe it's someone at that level? Um, cause that's who I deal with at my age now I'm approaching 40. It, it's not the, I know it doesn't say you started treating me uh, when I was like 28 or something. Yeah. Um, you're lad. I'm your lad. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it yeah, cause a lot of times there is some stuff, some of it that's youth. That girl don't like me, you know, <laughs> I'm not on the TV yet. All that kind of stuff. That stuff 
you can, it certainly factors in. I'm not belittling it in a long term sense. No, that's good. But um, yeah, finding um, do you, in, in establishing when you break it down, do you find that little piece of hope and start to dig towards that? And, and can that someone maybe on their own right now? Can, they can do that too. You know, it it it's uh, it's so much easier when someone is you know cares about you and and is sensitive towards you who cares about you and also knows you and again in in a therapeutic context Mm -hmm. the person it isn't that the therapist only is there in some in some um technical um clinical Mm -hmm. uh, way in which they're you know they're running you through a a list of uh you know different uh symptoms in 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 their mind to say okay you're here or you're there there's also a real relationship that develops and a fondness that develops in yeah. in and so you have the you have the luxury of someone who's paying a lot of attention to you and seeing things in you and mm. and can see the good or can see the 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 step towards the light you know to see some kind of sense of courage or some kind of sense of resiliency because of something you did and mm-hmm. you weren't even aware of it and then to be able to focus on that and to understand it and to to sort of piggyback on it in in other aspects of one's life you yes you do open it up you open up the person's goodness because mm-hmm. under god we all have goodness mm-hmm. we all have goodness and to open that up so that the the person himself can see mm-hmm you, you mentioned God, and we go into um, a little bit on the uh, religion side of things. Um, you, you've spoken about uh, – you were talking the other day with me about how you, you're, you're going to address or have addressed uh, Christians who don't feel that they should get depressed or don't understand why they still get depressed. And that to me um, – it doesn't have to be specific to Christianity. Uh, it could be any kind of faith-based thing where you're supposed to have this divine uh, inherent hope by signing up. Um, and it doesn't always come automatically. Yeah. Uh, what about that? I thought that was an interesting topic we had off air the other day. A bit. Yeah, the, the interesting thing about about any healthy religion, but but speaking from a Christian perspective, mm-hmm. um, one of the things that should happen is that you have a greater respect for reality, mm-hmm. and the reality of living in this world is that um, there is a lot of disappointments, and again, there's a lot of loss, and there's pain, and because there is suffering and death, there mm-hmm. is a deep sense of um, you know, not just the sadness, but but even the fears of of being abandoned and and being alone, uh, especially when you know when, when you're a child and those kinds of things happen. You know, in different religions, again, Christianity uh, for sure has ways of approaching this and discussing this. But but uh, the scripture never talks about not not suffering in this world, but mm-hmm. being but being overcomers and dealing with it. So mm-hmm. when Christians talk about one shouldn't get depressed, it's just a faulty understanding about the nature of reality, mm-hmm. the nature of this world. Uh, you know, being a Christian, believing in Christ, being connected to the church and the loving body of Christ, those, those are all antidepressive kind of experiences and, and, and uh, on own, measures yeah. on their own. But... The fact that you are you you think that there's some kind of automatic uh, light, you know, sort of like an ET light within yourself <laughs> that sucks up all of the badness in this world, that's not for this world. That's yeah. not a biblical understanding of, yeah. of life. I say God's. Not, I always say God's not an ATM machine. You can't just go withdraw what you want out of it. <laughs> no, God is not <laughs> an fixed. ATM machine. Yeah. He's not. And, it was and, just, it was an interesting because I have run into that too, uh, uh, and that that was the other thing too. Is I grew up in this uh, um, great supportive household and church and all that kind of stuff, and it, to still find it uh, that I was struggling with this stuff, particularly in the early twenties when I had gone back to church after I'd stopped for about five years and was heavily involved in it at the time. Um, it has still come out of it with some of these feelings uh, hurt even more, confused me even more because it was a misunderstanding of what I was going there every Sunday for, I guess. I was like, I, I checked this off the box. <laughs> yeah. What's wrong? I filled out the form that said happiness. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, in 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 uh, different places in the Bible, you'll see very famous people, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that, that, that uh, you know, the Judeo-Christian uh, uh, ethic and heritage, mm-hmm. um, who got depressed, 
You know, yeah. the, the Apostle Paul got depressed. Uh, Elijah got depressed. Mm-hmm. Um, David, David, great King David got depressed. Even even uh, Jesus himself, when when they speak of the experience in the Garden of Gethsemane, the mm-hmm. words that are used about his emotions, about going to the cross, are very powerful emotional words related mm-hmm. to um, not just despondency but terror. Yeah, take this cup, give it to someone else. <laughs> yeah, I don't want this. Yeah, I mean, so, and and it's interesting because you have these, you know, the the the, mm-hmm. the leaders of the faith. Mm-hmm. Um, who in their humanity experience depressive affect, mm. and yet you know there are there are uh, church people, Christian people who say that we shouldn't. Yeah, or, or not understand it too. You had a list uh, coming in here tonight of uh, some famous people uh, who did suffer from depression, oh. and not just the blues, man. We're talking about the deep stuff. Uh, oh. You had a pretty impressive list. Some, yeah, I went, yeah, I can imagine that, but some I didn't. I'm going to give you the list, and then I'm going to read you a quote from from Abe Lincoln. Mm-hmm. Uh, this list is found in the book uh, Depressive Illness, again, The Curse of the Strong by Tim uh, Contefor. Um he says, this is so great, he says uh, uh, that, you know, if you think that you, that it's wrong to be depressed, if you think that you're weak and that you should be ashamed of yourself because you're feeling depressed or you've contra- says, contracted this illness in the sense of major mm-hmm. depression, he says, you've got, it, you've, you, you, you've got it all wrong. You've got it all wrong. You're in good company. This mm-hmm. is an affliction of both the good and of the great. Mm-hmm. These are a handful of those who have suffered from it. Oliver Cromwell, Abraham Lincoln, Isaac Newton, Edgar Allan Poe, Ludwig von Beethoven, Vincent van Gogh, Winston Churchill, and Ernest Hemingway. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Quite a few people. I mean, Virginia Woolf is another one. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, I mean, talk about being silly. Uh, mm-hmm. It is silly to the point of absurdity. To think that because you have clinical depression, you're you're uh, somehow either morally or physically weak, or or, or out of the race. I mean, yeah. it, it's Abraham Lincoln. I won't read that quote, but Abraham Lincoln, mm. uh, which is it's well known that he was very much uh, uh, carried a huge weight on his shoulders yeah. um, during the Civil War, but was also uh, very much of a depressant before when he was a, a, right. an attorney in Illinois and. Um, there are plenty of anecdotal um, evidence and stories about that. Uh, yet he was an overcomer. Mm-hmm. Um, he was an overcomer. He, he had the strength of and fortitude to to stay focused on an ideal. And again, that would be another aspect of working uh, towards healthiness: um, getting out of yourself, mm-hmm. getting focused on something larger than yourself. Yeah. You know the causes that are out there, ph- philanthropic or 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 even just causes that are helpful to people's fundamental needs, mm-hmm. helps you to uh, get out of yourself and focused on the other. Yeah, like I said, when you're when you're in the, in that tidal wave of depression, all you can think about is yourself. It is the ultimate uh, ego trip. It's the anti ego trip, unfortunately. But yeah, that's all you can think about. Everything applies to you and how bad uh, you feel or how you can't overcome it. And that's the thing, again, I keep going back to that when I analyze it, especially back then. Um, feeling bad is one thing. Not lacking the the hope or lacking the ability to overcome it or that you think you can't overcome it is probably what buried me more than anything. Well, and, and being told that somehow you're... you're uh you're bad for being for being weak. Yeah. You're bad, and and I never have understood uh, the the rationale behind um, shaming somebody who is suffering. Mm-hmm. Uh, in some way, their their reactivity um, is supposed to be able to uh, uh, help them, um, you know, with that suffering. I've never understood that. Mm. Absolutely. Um, is there anything more on those notes there before we start to wrap up? Because you've got a lot of notes. Uh, I've had I've had a lot of people before come in with notes to the show about their favorite movies, uh, Alicia Malone and Stacey Howard. But now I have you with notes about depression. I want to make sure we get all your notes that we've covered on it there. Uh, I, I, I love that we've kind of laid out a pathway of um, getting back to a healthy state. And I think that's very important for people to hear, to know. 
that uh, there's a way out. And we all hear that phrase, hold on for one more day, from the Wilson Pickett song, now Wilson Phillips. We all hear that stuff and can make fun of it or it becomes trite. Um, but we've laid a, you, I, you've laid a little bit of a pathway. I've recently uh, listened to Eric Clapton uh, and B.B. King's uh, uh, album they did together and they do this wonderful rendition of hold on I'm coming hold on I'm coming and you know the idea of someone who is depressed and in the ways we've been talking about and they hear someone who cares for them to say is saying to them hold on yeah. I'm coming mm-hmm. um, if we need a song that's the song I, I want to leave your audience with mm-hmm. um, it's riding with the king with, with Eric Clapton and B.B. King um, it's important, one thing I also would, would want to make sure, it's important that people can, can evaluate themselves um, and not be ashamed to go ask somebody about what they think is going on within them. Mm-hmm. And if you are, you know, for more than a couple of weeks, I mean, for sure, if it's a month, this period of time, have, have had a down mood, I mean, a real mood that you're not yourself, Things that used to bring you pleasure and joy do not do that anymore. You know, you see the negatives in everything. You're you're much more aware of your physical body in the sense of physical pain in your body. You're 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 impatient. You know, you can't concentrate. If you're having difficulty sleeping mm-hmm. or want to sleep too much in the day yeah. if you're having difficulty eating or you want to eat more than you have or there's a weight loss of at least five to eight percent of your of your body weight within this month of, of downness you know these kinds of symptoms because they aren't going away in the ways that you're trying to deal with them um, go talk to somebody about them don't mm-hmm. don't isolate even if it's your friends Talk to them. See what they're seeing in you. It is it is not a shameful thing to be depressed, as as you can mm-hmm. see that even the most amazing president of this country, Abraham Lincoln, was clinically depressed. Mm-hmm. So it it happens. Um, you know there are reasons for it. Some sometimes complex, sometimes not so much so. But you need to be able to see and to take care of yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Well said, and. Um uh, do I have to charge you? Or do, are you charging me for this session? I don't or no, Or is it just because the microphones are here? It's, it's a freebie? Okay. Well, what I get is I get to have free <laughs> choice of your incredible music collection oh, of CDs. Outstanding. I've got some Spice Girls uh, waiting for you there. Oh, uh, you can pick the greatest hits if you want. Um, hey, I uh, I appreciate you coming in and sharing uh, a lot of this stuff. There's so much more to talk about. I'm sure. I mean, I'm looking at your book here. Your books here. We haven't even uh, really dived into bipolar disorder and a lot of other stuff, which is a is a whole other ball game, but still related. Um, yes. so maybe it's something we can do in the future. Well, I'm your man if if you wish. Yeah, well, I'd like to do some. Uh, you know, I think it's important at these times. It, it is an issue near and dear to me because it's something that I. Um, have suffered and still suffer and will continue to suffer. And that's something I have to accept sometimes is that this is, this is going to be around a while. And this depression is a friend. And that's the most dangerous thing for me these days. Uh, it, it, I've been you know good for a while. But like I said, about two months ago, I went through something because it, it came back like a friend. It slunk on into the bar, said, hey, here's a drink. Have a drink. Let's stay a while. And sometimes it's okay. Allow myself a day sometimes, like, all right, I'll have a drink with depression. I'll dance with the devil by the pale moonlight. But then this last one, it was about two weeks, and it kept going, and I, I was able to pull myself out of it with the help of some good friends uh, and hearing the support of some friends who were who could tell something was wrong. So instead of just, hey, how you doing? How's the weather? Call, emotional calls to me to check on me. And, and, and when you feel that, and that's what you were talking about earlier, having the right people around who – recognize even in just that picture you didn't look right in that picture no so they give me a ring i yeah. noticed you were this way yeah and it wasn't just because you were tired like you kept saying uh they knew me because i've been honest and open with them they knew me enough to call and check in and that that and that particular incident was alone alone was enough for me to uh dig myself out of it um well there's there's nothing better than to have someone whom you respect and think highly of mm-hmm. say to you you know i noticed you mm-hmm. outstanding and if you don't have anyone like that if you're listening you feel you don't um 
go go find a professional go find someone uh hey even i've had people reach out to me uh which is uh 10 years ago would have been scary it would have been the blind leading the blind but now i have a sense of perspective and i and i'll do that too um so uh dr ventime it is uh, a pleasure well thank you to get, share you with the world because you, you mean so much to me and what you did for me um and continue to do for me um i i usually at this point i um have my guests promote themselves but i imagine you don't have a twitter feed no i don't <laughs> I imagine you're not on facebook no i'm not <laughs> Um, you got some books out there they can buy something. I want you to do something. Well, I do have a, I have a book that is uh, in the process of uh, being published, but mm. I, I really can't get into it oh, yet okay. until it does until get it does. published. And so, you know, you'll have me on here another time. And Absolutely. I'll be able to really hawk that. But, but you know, I mean, it's fine <laughs> with me. Make sure that if you're hurting, that you don't hurt alone. That's yeah. the, the number one aspect. If someone else knows who cares for you, there's the opportunity to to brainstorm and to seek some kind of of um, some kind of help that'll mm-hmm. be good for you. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a very serious issue, but one we can deal with. One I still deal with with humor at times, um, and sometimes it's so ingrained people mis, uh, misunderstand my uh, self deprecation and self loathing at times. Uh, yeah, it gets deep, and yeah, it comes from a dark place. But I, I am so much better than I was ten, fifteen years ago. The people who know me then, who see me now, um, uh, can't uh, can't recognize me at times. Sometimes, not physically, just who are you? Yeah. What, what happened to that guy we knew? And that I owe a lot of that to you, sir. And and, uh, your son Thank and the so other much. people in my life who uh, I allowed in my life. And that's the key thing. You have to allow that kind of help into your life. But go out and seek it. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you uh, for making the trek out here to beautiful Studio City. It was long and arduous, <laughs> uh, and I felt a little depressed on the way, but uh, I made it. But you made it because you have a lot of Eric Clapton and Neil Young playing in your car, I'm well, sure. You, you are right. Down by the river. So this has been another edition of the Knapsack Files. Don't forget to find us on iTunes, and if you're there, subscribe, rate, and review. We're also on Stitcher. And the Knapsack Files has a Facebook page. Go and find it there. Like and uh, send me a message if you want on that page. Uh, if you uh, anything I can help you with, I will do my best. And uh, don't forget the other things I'm involved with. Uh, you can follow me at Twitter, at Ken Knapsack, and I'm part of the Schmoes No Movie Show live every Thursday on SchmoesNo.com, 6 p.m. PST, and Jedi Alliance, the uh, highly rated iTunes uh, Star Wars podcast, a celebration of the greatest saga ever told with my co-host, Mark Garrett, uh, on the Schmoes No Network. There's a lot of ways to uh, plug in and find me. Um, and I'm proud of it, Dr. Gary, because... Uh, it took me a long time to get to a sp- space where I'm proud of my I work. I am so proud of you. I mean, just what you just said was amazing, and, <laughs> and I could barely follow it, but more power to you, Ken. Uh, we are here in the future. So until next time, I'm Ken Napsack. That is our show.